Christmas. What a privilege uh, when we had this, uh, this family here the last time. And I, I just, all I want to say before he comes is uh, thank God for your faithfulness. Amen. You know how many souls he would know and only Christ would know in Alaska that have come to know the Lord. Churches started, you know, because you were faithful and much more than this, that this couple was. So, Brother Nick, would you come, brother, and give us the word of God. Thank you, Pastor Al. I do. Well, it's a stomping room. Great to see each of you today. It's been many, many years since we've been here. What a joy. God's been so good to us. I didn't have my wife with me last time, so I brought her along this time so you folks can get to meet her. Her name is Joan. We're both 71 years old. And she's a, a, a month older than me. Why don't you stand, honey, and I'll introduce you. This is my wife, Joan. This is the, this is the best part of the, the mission team. She's the mother of our 27 uh, grandchildren and our 10 great-grandchildren. God's just been blessing us immensely through the years. He's just so good to us. I can't brag on the Lord Jesus enough Amen. for how good he is, how gracious he is. And how precious he is to us, as I'm sure he is to you. Uh, See, so last time, Pastor Al and I was working on a message. We called it, uh, When the Rebels Ate the Chicken. I'd like to preach that today, but the Lord led me a different direction. It was about the Civil War and uh, how uh, they planned on winning that, war, that battle the first day out. The North did, but the South ended up eating all the baskets of chicken as, as they ran home back to Washington. And that was, a, that was a good message. We used it through the years. It's just a catchy title, but it was a, a real blessing. I'm going to preach on the faith today because that's what God wants to us to increase is our faith. So we're going to preach. I'm going to start in the book of Second Chronicles. We're going to Hebrews. You don't have to turn to Second Chronicles. I'm just going to read one verse that tells us that the eyes of the Lord search to and fro throughout the whole earth to so show himself strong on the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. And that's what the Lord's eyes are doing today as we preach this precious gospel of our Lord Jesus. His eyes are searching to and fro, just looking for somebody whose heart is perfect toward him, that he might bless them in a special way. So I hope today that each of you find yourselves in that position before we leave here today as we preach on faith, that your faith will be increased by this message. That's my intent, Lord willing, that your faith will increase. We're going to Hebrews chapter Number 11 to start with. With that in mind that the eyes of the Lord are searching through and fro throughout of our, our hearts today. And the Holy Spirit is looking for somebody whose heart is perfect toward him. And that is, as ministers of the gospel, that's our desire as we preach the word of God. That, that we would see God, the Holy Spirit, move in hearts. And make them right if they're not right. Bless and encourage each one. I'm going to share a lot of things with you that you may have never heard before. But I'm going to share them with you from a missionary's viewpoint. Which is a little bit different than most church members or pastors. As we're going to see. In Hebrews chapter number 11, which is the great faith chapter in the scripture. It says faith. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen were made of things which do not appear. We stop and think about the creation and the creation story. And there's three chapters dedicated to that in Genesis. That's all. That's it. 
And the rest of the chapters are talking about Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, a whole lot on Joseph. But God spends all of his time in his word dealing with people. The creation, he just kind of sloughs off and goes on. He figures everybody ought to be smart enough to understand creation. Because <laughs> he only spends three chapters on it. And we think of creation. I don't find it too hard to believe that God spoke and there the world was. Do you? I don't find that too hard to believe. I can't hardly go for this theory that a piece of goo climbed out of the slough went to the zoo and now it's you. I find believing that God created uh, the earth and the heavens and the galaxies far easier to believe than what man leaps to as an explanation for creation. And God calls that faith. To me it's simplicity. Although it's faith in God's word. I'm glad for God's explanation. I certainly wouldn't have one apart from God's explanation. But that's certainly fine with me. Amen? Isn't it fine with you folks? God said it. That settles it. I used to say, wrongly so. God said it, and I believe it. And that settles it. But I've come to learn through the years... <laughs> with a little more wisdom than I used to have. It doesn't matter what I believe. God said it, and that settles it. No matter if I believe it or not, it's still God said it, and that settles it. I'm going to deal with three things today you might write down, lest I not get to all of them. Number one, faith. Faith sees the invisible. Faith sees the invisible. Number two, faith believes the incredible. Amen. What we believe certainly is incredible. I can't wait to get out of here and get a new body. This one can't even make it at the repair shop and do much good anymore. <laughs> and number three, in closing, faith receives the impossible. Amen. Faith receives the impossible, which is the resurrection from the dead. It's what we're going to enjoy. We call it the rapture commonly. But we're going to enjoy a new body. Praise God. What a joy. So let's begin with number one. Faith sees the invisible. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So things which appear were made of things which do not appear. Things which are seen are made of things which do not appear. I mean, I'm messed up here. Through faith we understand that the words were, worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now the importance of faith is found in verse 6 where we find that faith is something you can hold on to. It's a substance. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That's what God says our faith is. It's something you can get hold of. It's a substance. It isn't just some fly-by-night theory. We believe the word of God. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians, please. Now let's apply a little bit of this to our lives. Turn if you would to chapter 10. Now we desire to take the word of God further as missionaries. That's always a missionary's hope. And God says in this chapter, starting in verse number 13, chapter 10. But we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God hath distributed to us, a measure to reach even unto you. For we stretch not ourselves beyond our measure, as though we reach not unto you, but we are come as far as to you. He's talking to Corinth. 
also preaching the gospel of Christ. Not boasting of things without our measure, that is, of other men's labors. But having hope, you might underline this in your scripture, but having hope, when your faith is increased, that we shall be enlarged by you, according to our role abundantly, to do what in verse 16? To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. Now we know it's God's will. There's 242 villages in Alaska. Most of them 300 people or less. So if you're going to go and plan on a ministry uh, having great numbers, you're never going to have one. But somebody has to go to reach them villages of 300. Amen? And how is this going to happen? Now the Bible says here, but having hope when your faith is increased. He's talking to the Corinthian church. When your faith is increased, that we will be able to take the gospel to regions beyond you. And that's where missionaries come in. Missionaries take the gospel to regions that you can't get to. But you can certainly help be a part of. The whole goal of the Lord Jesus in creating the church was to get the gospel to the ends of the world. To which end we are all committed. That's his ultimate goal is to get the gospel to every creature. Amen? Amen. To this we all agree. Now when can this happen according to Paul? Number one, we know it's God's will. The all 242 Eskimo villages and Indian villages and the Yukon and the Alaskan territories get the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's God's will. It goes without saying. Number two, it's this missionary's will. I would love to get the gospel to all 242 of them. But obviously, being one person, there's no way I can do that. This last church we started, Jubilee Baptist Church uh, in Sterling, Alaska. It took me 10 years. It's taking longer and longer as time goes on and closer we get to the second coming of Jesus. It's taking longer and longer to get a church established. So the missionary's heart and his desire is to get the gospel to every creature. Now who's missing in the formula? It's the church. It says, when your faith, Corinthian church, when your faith is increased, then we can get the gospel further. So that means the church is the thing that God's going to use to get the gospel further. And we're all sure that that's God's will for our church. Amen? God wants to use us, every one of us, to get the gospel further. And I want to share a couple of thoughts with you in that line. Prayer is the most important thing we have. We are a group of intercessors. God wants us to intercede in prayer. Prayer is the most important and the most powerful thing we have at our disposal. And I'm, I love to see what you guys are planning. It's a wonderful thing. Fasting and prayer. Our prayers take more time every day as, as uh, we age as Christians. We used to say a, a wing and a prayer and go on and, and do the important things. Not realizing the important thing was prayer. Now concerning missionaries. I need your prayers. I covet your prayers. I'm glad you pray for me. Bless Pastor Bickish, missionary Bickish and his family. But I wish you would pray, Lord, bless Brother Bickish, bless Mrs. Bickish, and bless their children, and then name them. If you're going to pray for anybody and skip somebody, don't skip my wife and my children. It's much more important that you pray for them than me. I'm not saying don't pray for me, but if you're going to skip somebody, skip me. I need you to pray for my wife. If you study most missionaries and most missionary letters, 
most of them come off the field because of the marital situation and the children's situation. If Satan's going to work on somebody in your family, take it personal, where does he work the hardest? He's going to work on your kids. What's the linkest, uh, weakest link in your family? It's your children. They need prayer more than anybody needs prayer. So God had challenged my heart a long time ago that we pray, we pray for our missionaries. But we pray for the husbands and the wives and all of the kids. Take on all of their problems in our prayer closet. So we've committed to memory, and I pray for at least twice a day, every missionary that we support at Jubilee Baptist Church, and every missionary's wife, and every missionary's child, I take to the Lord in prayer. I've personally committed them to my memory to pray for them. For an example, I pray for the Akanas in, in Hawaii, Kevin and Roxanne Akana, and for their work, Windward Baptist Church. I pray for Kelsey and Kylie and Kimmy Ann, for Kason and for Keith. Every day, I commit their names to God and ask God to bless their children. There are teenagers now, they're going through the toughest time of life. How many teenagers have I personally led to the Lord? Only to see them later grow up and fall apart. Do stupid things in their lives. Satan comes in and gets hold of them and makes a mess out of their lives. I think it's a lack of prayer on our part. So I'm going to challenge you today when you pray for me. To pray for me and for my wife and my children. Commit their names to the Lord and pray for us every day. My one son has just gone through a divorce. God called him to preach. Many years ago he married the wrong woman. His life is all fouled up. He needs prayer. He needs the Lord Jesus to intercede in his life. Breaks our heart to see what happened. But I remember Prittner getting into a fist fight with him over that marriage. And after the wedding, I sat down on the altar and I wept. The reason I wept, I could never tell him. Because I knew he destroyed his life with what he did. Married 19 years to an unfaithful woman. And today his life is all messed up. He needs prayer. I wonder if God's people's prayers might have helped change some of that through the years. If we thought it was important enough to pray for a missionary's family. So I challenge you to commit that to your own personal life. And take these words as wisdom from someone who is living it. I need your prayers. My wife needs your prayers. But my kids need your prayers worse than all of us. So if you're going to skip praying for somebody, skip me. I'm committed to the battle. My wife's is probably stronger than me. And she's certainly committed to that. But our kids are going to go through it. As yours do. I'm sure this message you can relate with your own children. Some of the things that's going on in your lives. That God would have changed in your life. So faith. Number one. In the Lord. Is the secret. But who does God want to use to see the. The success of this mission program, he wants you. Every one of us here today. So I challenge your heart. Consider this message. From a missionary who's lived it and knows what he's saying. Prayer is the most important tool that we have. God's left us here and our main job is to be intercessors. Amen. And I know it's great to be soul winners. That's good. It's great to study your Bibles. That's good. But our main ministry is intercession. God wants us to intercede for the lives, souls of men and women and boys and girls throughout the earth. What better way to reach them 
and through our mission program. So I don't know what you, what you have back on your wall concerning missions, but I'd venture to say you may be able to uh, use this as wisdom about how you pray for missionaries and their families. Maybe reconsider your own prayer lives. Maybe we need to get to work as God's people and go to work learning and memorizing a few things about our missionary program back there. Because those kids all on that wall are targets for Satan. What better way to mess up, mess up a missionary family than through his children? And what better place to get in touch with demon spirits in the work of demons than in the foreign mission field? That's exactly what happened when we went to Ross River in Yukon Territory. It was demon possessed. It was a whole lot like it is in Tonawanda today, back then. Rampant, wicked sin on every corner. Not safe to, to go down the street. You couldn't leave your wife alone ever. She would probably have been raped and murdered. We watched the Holy Spirit do a marvelous work in that village and increase our faith. That God has blessed us so abundantly. I will share a few things with you concerning that, how God built my faith. First of all, I was uh, in the Yukon Territory in a place called Ross River. We were landed immigrants. We were there probably six years. And God laid on my heart to preach in the North Country in the Bering Sea. So I had a friend I'd been trying to win to Christ. He was a Nazarene, had a Nazarene background, but he was lost as could be. And he found out I was going up to Aklavik. And he came to me one day and he said, Preacher, he said, I've got a 206 Cessna turbocharged. He said, if, if I could go with you, we'll take my plane. Well, if you know anything as a pilot, a carburetor is a, an ugly thing to have in the Arctic. Because it ices up. But a turbocharger is a whole lot better. So I said, well, praise God, the Lord has blessed this trip already. So I agreed that Dirk would fly his plane. He and I would fly up to this Eskimo village on the Bering Sea to preach the gospel. We took off. It took us about two hours to get across what we call the Plains of Abraham to the bottom of the Mackenzie Mountains, which are 12,000 feet high. And as you know, a small engine plane can't normally go over 10,000 feet high. So we made it to the top of the Mackenzies, 12,000 feet, to the headwaters of the Bonnet Plume River. Started down the other side, made it to the bottom of the Bonnet Plume, which went into the Mackenzie, went north to the Mackenzie River till we hit the Peel River, about 150 miles down the Peel River, hung a left and went to the little Eskimo village called Eklavik. Went and knocked all the doors when we got there, inviting the Eskimo folks to special services. I think about uh, eight people showed up the first night. I preached on Revelation 20, 11 to 15, which was the white throne judgment. And uh, Buck Storrs was there and his wife. He was the chief of the Eskimos. And I saw a conviction all over him that night. They loved music. We spent about an hour playing. I played the accordion. So we had the accordion, a trumpet, a guitar. We had a great time with the music. And they loved that. And I preached. When we got done, they all dismissed and went home. And that night, Dirk Zutter was his name was under real conviction. Went back to our uh, little apartment where we were staying there and I spent about four hours to about four in the morning with him and I led him to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That was so exciting. Amen. Not, not too shabby to have a saved pilot. Amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> so... The next night, we had about 30 Eskimos show up. Word got around the village that we had music and singing and we're having a great time and they all came to hear the Word of God. So, Buck Storrs got saved that night and his wife. 
and about six other people found Christ. Amen. And the church got started from that group right there with the following year. Went on through the week, and by the end of the week, we had the place packed out every night. And I got to preach a gospel to that Eskimo tribe. It was just blessed of the Lord. The Holy Spirit just fell on it in a wonderful way. When it was time to leave, they have what's called ice fog in the Arctic. And we wanted to leave the next Monday, but we couldn't get out because of the ice fog. And it was fogged in for three days. And we couldn't fly. We only had about a 1,500 foot ceiling. We couldn't see above that. The fourth day, we got up and the ceiling was up probably 3,000 feet. Then it was fogged in. And I said to Dirk, what do you think, Dirk? We make it? We prayed about it and had peace to go ahead and go. So we had to fly under the ice fog till we hit the Mackenzie River, flew down the Peel River under the fog. And Dirk told me, he said, when the sun comes out by midday, this ought to clear up and lift. So at the time we hit the Mackenzie Mountains, which was the dangerous part, he says, then the fog will probably be gone. We can get up over that 12,000 foot hump. So we got up probably 200 miles, flew up the Mackenzie River, hit the Bonnet Plume, hung a right, started up the Bonnet Plume River. And I looked over at Dirk, and I noticed he was very nervous. His face had turned blood red. When your pilot gets nervous, you know you got a problem. And I looked out, and on each wing, we were collecting ice on our wings. And I said, tell me the truth, Dirk, how long do we got left in the air? He said, preacher, he said, we don't have more than five to ten minutes at the most. And then we're going to come down. I said, I'll tell you what, Dirk, you fly this thing and I'll pray. Amen. So I went to 2 Chronicles 14, 11, my favorite prayer is Ace's prayer, Lord. It's nothing for thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest in thee and in thy name we go against whatever problem. And I prayed for the icing problem. And Dirk was flying and, and getting more nervous all the time because our time was getting short. No sooner than had I said amen, and I looked at the thermometer on the inside of the plane, which told the outside temperature. And it was 55 below zero at the time when we were flying. All of a sudden, it went up to 45 below. Then up to 35 below. Then to 25 below. Then to zero. Then went up to 10 above, 20 above, 30 above, 40 above, 55 above zero. And water started dripping off the wings of the plane. And a great big sheet of rime ice blew off the left wing, and Dirk had to correct it. Then a great big sheet of rime ice blew off the right wing. And Dirk looked over at me. He says, wow, he says, prayer works, don't it? <laughs> said, amen, prayer works. When God had done, he brought us what's known as the Chinook. A very rare instance in the North Country when God speaks to the winds of Hawaii and says, I need you to go north. And of course, he started about three days in advance. So the Chinook hit our plane exactly at the right moment wow. after I said amen. And God blew a Chinook in there and took care of our problem. Amen. Amen. So God taught me about prayer many years ago. I've been in life-threatening situations so many times in my life and watched God deliver me. God's just been so good to me and my family. We made it on up the Bonnet Plume River. We ended up over the Mackenzie's. The ice cleared. The fog cleared as we went up over. And we made it back to Ross River. By God's grace. And with those souls that were saved, the church got started and the Klavik is there to this day. What a blessing. But I'm sharing that with you to tell you that 
God wants you and I to be intercessors. We don't know what our missionaries are going through. What life-threatening situation they may be in. The very moment you're praying, God will be answering your prayer by sending a Chinook out of Hawaii to land at the perfect time some missionary flying in the Arctic trying to get the gospel of Jesus Christ to somebody. Amen. So your prayer is so important. I can't emphasize this enough. How important your prayers are in the missionary's life. God blesses prayer. We see the invisible. We serve an invisible God, but he makes his presence known very visibly. Amen. So I have all the faith in the world that God is blessing our lives. So many things have happened through the years. Another time, I got a call in Ross River, the nursing station in Pharaoh, asking me to go find John Lutz. Now, John Lutz was a young, he was Indian. He came up from Watson Lake, 250 miles away for the summer. He and his woman, Jocelyn, Jocelyn Dick, there's no marriage at all ever in Yukon when we got there. So when we met little John and Jocelyn, we prayed that God would bring them to Ross River, that we could deal with them. We really loved them people. And they were just lost, drunken Indian folk. And Jocelyn was having a baby. So the nursing station in Pharaoh called me and asked me to go find John. So I went over to the village and I knew that the Indian bucks were missing all week long. I hadn't seen them. I figured they were a Buck Charlie's cabin. So when I went over, they were all passed out on the floor. Had been that way, I don't know, probably a day or so, drunk, passed out. I went in and I found little John in one of the bunks underneath two or three other guys on top of him. And you know what drunks do. They were just an absolute mess. So I picked them up by the belt and hauled them out in the back porch. Got a garden hose and sprayed them off the best I could. <laughs> Took them into Pharaoh to the nursing station. I felt sorry for them poor nurses. And little John was with Jocelyn. They had a baby girl. So the Indians got furious at me one of the many times that they got furious at me because I'd gone in their cabin and took little John out and took him to the nursing station. They were indignant, so they decided to kill me and my wife and family. So it was about four in the morning. They all got their 308s and their, three, or their 303s and their 3030 Winchesters and their machetes and whatever they had. And they started for our cabin. About four in the morning, they got to my sandbox. I built a 12 foot by 16 foot sandbox for the kids. They all brought their Tonga toys and everything played in that sandbox. But that was my property line. When they stepped into the sandbox, my property line, they looked up and there was four angels Amen. in white apparel one at each corner of my cabin. They got terrified and turned around and ran for their lives. Now I've never seen the angels of God, but by faith I've read about it. I just put it off when they told me about it later. When they told me about it, I just put it off as hallucinations from a bunch of uh, drunks having snakes climbing the walls and all that they have. Pay no attention to it until I was out here preaching one time, read a book uh, by George Patton. And he was a missionary to the New Hebrides yes. Islands. And in one chapter in there, he talks about, he was working with cannibals, how they were going to come over and kill him and put him in the stew pot. And they went down the bank and up the other side to the back of his thatched hut. They looked and there where the cabin was, surrounded by men in white apparel, glistening apparel. They turned around and ran for their lives because they realized the power of God was on this preacher. 
And I got to thinking about my experience. I thought to myself then, this was a couple years later, my word, I had this happen to me and I just shrugged it off. But I'm here to tell you today that we serve a living God. Amen. And the angels of God protect his children. And we need God's supernatural protection in order to make it. Praise God. We believe the incredible. I believe in the angels of God. I believe God takes care of you and I. I believe that all of us here today would be dead if it was up to the devil. And out of here. I believe it's a supernatural power of God that you're here today. And being blessed of, and used of God in any way. God is our keeper, he's our guide, he's our intercessor, he's our savior. Amen. And we do his bidding. I praise God for the privilege. Last of all, faith receives the impossible. One day we're going to step out of this body and have a brand new body. Amen. It's what's called a resurrection. Amen. And boy, am I looking forward to that. Yeah. No more canes. Boy, I'm going to sling that cane so far. <laughs> Amen. God's just going to bless you in my life. What a wonderful promise from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Faith receives the impossible. And boy, we sure have through the years. We've received the impossible from the Lord. God's just been so good to us. I can't stress stress how good he is. He wants us to preach the gospel in the regions beyond and what he's going to use to do that is your and my faith. He wants us to exercise our faith, believe in our God in a mightier way than we did when we walked in today. I pray that your heart has been challenged in some way with some of these things we've been sharing with you. God's challenged your heart. Maybe you need to learn how to pray for your missionaries. And pray for their needs and pray for their kids and pray for their ministries pray for their fields we're not going to reach these fields without prayer God chooses prayer by his grace to bless his people you are a blessed people no doubt about that but if there's anything here today that we can improve on I think that God would have us do it is everybody here happy with their faith or could your faith be increased a little bit? I think we all could use an increase in faith. Amen? Amen. God challenges us to do that. Because the reason you and I exist is to get the gospel further. God wants the gospel to go to every creature, doesn't he? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's God's will. God wants to use you and I to do that very thing. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10, Having hope, when your faith is increased, we shall be enlarged by you to our role abundantly to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you, not to boast in another man's line of things made ready to our hand. But he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. For not he that hath commended himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth. And this is what the Lord is commending. He's commending us to give our lives to the greatest purpose there is. And that is not only Tonawanda, New York. This is your base. But it's that board back there that needs intercession. Their wives need intercession. Their children need intercession. There's needs in their lives that can only be met by intercession. I think of Exodus 17 where Moses stood on the mountain with a rod held high. And there's Joshua down there and uh, Caleb, I believe, fighting the Amorites. And when, Josh, and when Moses' hand fell, uh, the Amorites were winning, or the Amalekites. And when he, they lifted up his hand, Lifted the rod of God. They started winning. Remember that story? Yes. That's a great message on intercessory prayer. When we are lifted up. And you are the Moses in this. 
when you're lifting up the rod toward God and praying, we get the victory. But when, you're, when you fail in prayer, we begin to lose the battle of the Amalekites. That's how important this is. This is how important your prayers are. I hope to bring to a realization today that your prayer life is the most important thing that we missionaries count on. We count on you. We feel we're in this together. This just isn't my calling. This is our calling. And God wants us to be effective in our calling. Amen? Amen. And you're certainly worthy of it. I hope your hearts have been challenged in a great way today in some way. God will use this message to help increase your faith. And you would think on these things that we've spoken. Father, I pray you bless this church in a mighty way. I pray you use them for your honor and for your glory. I pray you help to lift up Christ in their ministry. I pray for your power upon each of them. Lord, for your blessing upon each of them. I pray you'd use them. Father, help us together as we try to reach the gospel. Take it to every creature. Bless our after service now. Bless our invitation now. It is all for your honor. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All of God's people said? Amen. 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 Lord bless you.